webinar is called Quality Tolerance Limits, and this is uh, the part of uh, ICHE6 addendum that will definitely influence uh, actually everybody of us. And um, I think that um, it is essential to understand the co concept of quality tolerance limits before we come into the implementation um, of these addendum or before we make um, a gap analysis. Um, I'm, uh, uh, so this webinar will be 60 minutes and uh, please use the chat on the right side to ask the questions during the webinar. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, should be possible um, every time and we will uh, try to answer these questions uh, on the way. Um, so I'm, uh, um, I also want to say that there is a, a possibility to uh, order a certificate of attendance. For that you need actively request it uh, over the email uh, from where you got uh, the uh, invitation um, or over the email that uh, we will show you at the end of the webinar, so to, to me or to Andy. So uh, feel free uh, to request it. Um, of course, it will be possible only for those who, will, who, who participated. Um, so I'm happy to uh, welcome today uh, Andy Lawton. Uh, Andy Lawton was a head of biometrics and data management at Beringer Ingelheim for a long while. Uh, he worked as a working group member uh, and translate uh, for RBM and currently uh, is uh, offering his services as a consultant and helps also to Syntegrity uh, yeah, with the theory questions. Um, the topic uh, of uh, today's discussion is, uh, to my mind, is extremely important. Um, moreover, we will be experiencing uh, the uh, GCP addendum actually in, in several days. Um, so the, it comes to operations, as far as I remember, uh, on 14th of June, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And the quote we have chosen for this webinar is um, actually um, um, comes from William Thompson, uh, an Irish philosopher, and he said, what get measured, get managed, and what get managed gets done or gets improved. And that's what, uh, to my mind, quality tolerance limits are about. Uh, start measuring what you want to improve. And having seen that, um, I will pass the word to Andy, who will take care about the first part of the webinar. Uh, bringing the background of a ICH addendum, uh, a history of quality, quality tolerance limits, and maybe a glimpse into the future, and uh, how uh, will tell you how to use it um, uh, after the discussion of uh, potential benefits. Uh, he will p pass word back to me, and I will uh, take care about uh, the technology challenges. Uh, which are connected with implementation of quality tolerance limits. So again, feel free to use the chat on the right side. Um, uh, if you have any difficulties with audio or with the, with the, uh, with the, uh, with the slides, um, feel free to ask uh, on the way. We will try to fix it uh, if it will be possible. So and enjoy, uh, enjoy the, uh, the webinar itself. So Andy, it's your turn now. Right. Thank you, Artem, and good morning, good afternoon, or whatever time it is around the world. So I'm going to talk about the ICHE 6 addendum, section 5.04 on quality tolerance limits. Now, I'm going to be talking about it in two ways. I want to talk about the background to ICHE 6 both the structural background and non-structural. The non-structural part is the feedback I've had from discussions with regulatory authorities on these topics. And then next I'll be going on to uh, that single paragraph, which I think will radically change the way we address quality in our clinical trials. I'll be discussing how to use them and some potential areas of benefit to companies.
So this is what's led to ICHE6. If I just get the pointer, we had the first release in 1996. In fact, uh, quality tolerance limits did appear in a draft of the first release. That was back in 1995. And in that version, it was the statistician's responsibility. It disappeared in the final release. But the impact of Q9, which is on manufacturing, the risk-based approach has had an impact on this addendum. Also, the FDA draft guidance in 2011 and their final guidance in 2013 definitely impacted uh, a risk-based approach. And the EMA guidance draft also in 2011 and final in 2013 has probably had the biggest impact because it was in their EMA guidance that they first brought up again the concept of quality tolerance limits. Now ICHE6 has been under discussion for two years. It was made final uh, in November and as Artem correctly stated uh, it will be implemented in the EU on the 14th of June. So you still have about nine weeks to implement if you haven't done it already. Um, we know that the PMDA, uh, the Japanese authority is implementing uh, at the end of the first quarter of 2018. We haven't got a clear date uh, on when the FDA will implement. Now the focus in this addendum is on quality, uh, but virtually all the actions are for the sponsor to address. Computer system validation comes into it because we are in an electronic environment now. In 96, we were still in a paper-based environment, and yet many of our processes still treat our electronic data as if it were paper in doing batch processing from it. And the whole quality management system approach that's included uh, includes our risk-based approach and vitally quality tolerance limits and where we have to report the quality tolerance limits out is in the quality report. Now the future uh, we can already foresee the direction in which this is going because uh, we had the risk-based approach in manufacturing in 2006. The FDA have now dr issued draft guidance in November of last year on obtaining quality data metrics for um, manufacturing. So you can sit foresee that we will end up required, being required from data from our QMS or from clinical trials to produce metrics. This is already being foreseen in the, in the site data set, which is required for every submission. We, there have been additional fields added, which require us uh, to put in quality metrics. The FDA have not specified what metrics yet, but that will be coming. So what have been the drivers for the ICHE6 changes? Well, there's a lack of trust for our ICH GCP statements. In our submissions, uh, virtually every company states that based on X number of audits, uh, we believe all of our studies were run to ICH GCP. Now they select two studies in their inspections, they almost always find GCP issues. And so they can say, say, how can we trust your statements made there to what we see? So they're upset over this lack of transparency. They want defined quality. They want better transparency throughout. They also feel that uh, quality is Quality by design is not there. It's quality by accident is the quote that was given to me. 
and they want quality throughout the organization they feel that we're very siloed as organizations and part of the approach within risk-based monitoring is to get every rat one round the table uh, in the trial team to do the RACT, the risk assessment and categorization. Uh, and the reason they want us to do that is so that we are moving in one direction. They want better oversight. They believe we do poor root, root cause analysis. Um, we almost always end up that it was a training issue. Um, that may be a symptom, but it's certainly not the cause. And this is another quote, the stupidity of 100% SDV as a solution to quality. Um, the CRA misses the helicopter view of the site. They don't believe that we're getting uh, value for money from any of our processes. So the overall perspective is, uh, can you improve? Can you do better with what you're doing? Next slide. So quality by design. This, of course, starts with the protocol. If you haven't got a good protocol, uh, then no amount of good monitoring will save you. And they want defined quality, which we'll come to, transparency. And of course, part of quality by design, when we're in a fully electronic world, is computer system validation, CSV. The improved oversight, they'd like us to use the quality methods such as Deming's plan, do, study, act cycle. You may have seen this as the plan, do, check, act cycle, which was the invention of Schuhart. Better root cause analysis because they want us to focus on systematic issues. And that's what are issues that matter. And all of this should lead to more continuous quality improvement. Now, the other area is they want the PI still to have control of the source. It's not clear how we can meet those requirements uh, in our electronic age, but we've got to work out different methods to do that. Now, audits have been used as our quality measure, and they're not useful as a quality improvement tool. There's no predefined quality in an audit. They do not measure quality across the organization, as we only have, what, one and a half, two percent coverage of sites. They do not make a poor site a good site. We know that from looking at risk-based monitoring over the past seven, eight years that we've been running it. And we can see that uh, a poor site, which may be running in the red, once they've had an audit, they, it may improve for a week or two, but it then goes back to red after that. And consistency between auditors is poor. But they do not want them abandoned. They are good for pre-usage checks. They're good for random checks and for cause. So don't forget those. So this is the section that I believe will change the way we handle quality. And let's read it out. Predefined quality tolerance limits. That means you have to tell them what the quality is before you start the study. They should be established, taking into consideration the medical and statistical characteristics of the variables, as well as the design. So they're important factors. Deming would call this profound knowledge. That's W. Edwards Deming. And the purpose of these quality tolerance limits are to identify systematic issues that impact safety or reliability of trial results. So they tell, tell us what they need to be used for and uh, what areas, safety and data integrity. Detection of deviations should trigger an evaluation to determine if action is needed on the systematic issues. So 
It's not like in a manufacturing process where they have tolerance limits. If you build a car door too big, the batch gets rejected. It can't be used. What they're saying here is you, we don't want to make uh, it impossible to use the trial results. They just want them explained. The reason is that regulatory authorities like the FDA and the PDMA in Japan have both got uh, statistical monitoring tools which have detection methods for systematic errors. They just have to press a button and they know where they are. And so they know what the issues are and companies are not telling them. So this gives you a chance to tell them what the issues are and tell them whether it impacts the result. But it also gives you the benefit to define random errors. Some areas where we should consider implementing are for informed consent errors. Original consent should be treated differently from reconsent. Original consent should be close to perfect. I know we don't achieve that, but it should be. Reconsent will getting consent on time um, from everyone um, is, is very rare. Maybe we achieve 50%. Protocol violations at entry to the study, eligibility violations, uh, site transcription errors, and maybe on the expected number of adverse events per patient per unit, be it a year or whatever you specify. This gives the usage of tolerance limits over time. Time is shown on the bottom. They started, of course, with statistical quality control in the 1930s. This was down to Schuhart. Demin was in correspondence with Schuhart and adapted these methods to be the total quality control method, saying that quality was not just a function of manufacturing, but also of the finance department and HR. And both of these derived their methods from um, the thesis from Clarence Irvine Lewis, uh, a statistician and philosopher from Harvard and Stanford. Now, all of these processes, including all up to Six Sigma total quality management, the Japanese style, Kansai and Toyota's method, all of them rely on quality tolerance limits as a, an improvement method. So let's look at how we're going to apply this. Well, if you imagine that this bar on the left-hand side are the total errors in a clinical trial, what they want us to do is separate what are the random errors, shown in blue, to the systematic errors, errors that matter, shown in orange. We should define what we expect for random errors, and then measure, uh, define upper and lower quality tolerance limits. If we exceed that, or if we go below it, we should be prepared to do an analysis to explain what the impact is. What they hope for is a decrease in systematic issues over time. What the FDA and the EMA have been seeing when they publish their uh, reports on audit findings, inspection findings, they're seeing no change. And so they want us to address the systematic issues. So each study is a plan, do, study, act cycle. Within the industry, we're very good at planning. We do, but we very rarely study what the, acts, uh, the problems are or act upon them. How many monitoring plans have a monitoring report which says how, whether you went on site at, on time? And if not, what, what action should be taken from that to feed into the QMS quality management system for continuous quality improvement? For all the plans that we have for a clinical trial, the data monitoring plan, 
uh, communication plan, training plan, monitoring plan, central monitoring plan. There's only one plan that we have a report for, and that's the statistical analysis plan, where we have a trial report. None of the others do. And so we have to get used to studying what our failure points have been, acting upon them and improving them. And what, what this is giving us, they're giving us the benefit of random errors. So how would you do this? Well, in this example, uh, for looking at uh, inclusion exclusion protocol violations, we were looking at the diagnosis of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and we looked retrospectively at five different studies. We applied an algorithm to identify the, where there potentially was systematic error. And then we excluded that systematic part to leave only the random. We then made an estimate from that. But that's not the only thing that is needed. What you also need is, as Deming called it, profound knowledge to identify what's different about your study and that is not present in the historical data. We must remember that the protocol is probably one of the biggest impacts in, called, in causing protocol violations. The countries being used is what you're defining in your protocol, standard medical practice. The sites being used, the impact of using uh, SMOs instead of general practitioners, that has a big impact on the results you get as well as the experience and size of the sites being used. So bring all of that study aspects and design aspects together to decide on what your expectation should be and then set quality tolerance limits around that. So this quote is from Edwards Deming. Uh, Tolerance limits, acceptable defects rather than waste efforts on zero defect goals. We have had in the pharmaceutical industry a zero defect goal for years and years. We prevent, pretend that we get per, trying to get perfection and we never achieve it. And that's why we always get failings and inspection findings. Because we're going for perfection, they have to give us findings, even for minor errors. So tolerance limits also gives us a lot more than just the defined quality. We have to report out that defined quality, whether we've met it in the clinical study report in section 9.6. It gives us compliance at entry. If you're measuring this continuously, then you know when you've breached the quality tolerance limit. It reduces the burden for the company and the site, and it can reduce inspection issues. Tolerance limits can also give us knowledge management. Now, knowledge management consists of two parts. One part is the inherent statistical and medical knowledge on a product or any other knowledge of that type. The other part are the decision, the structural knowledge of what to do in certain situations what to do if we get certain types of protocol violations. And that we can build in. And it can also give you trial simulation because it starts you on that route. If you're getting your estimates right, you can go for smaller sample size studies or stop earlier with interim analyses if you know you're on schedule on all the quality and safety aspects. So now I'd like to pass back to Artem. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andy. Um, I have a couple of questions, if you allow me, uh, to yes. your part. And I would incentivize everybody also to ask their qu your questions. Uh, please use the chat on the right side. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, um, that the, we should concentrate on systematic errors. Um, uh, how can you estimate what is the percentage uh, from your experience of systematic errors versus random errors uh, 
uh, in a pharma company? It depends on the parameter on what we're looking at. Um, systematic errors. It, it, it really is down to the protocol. If you've got a protocol which is not following standard medical practice, then that can create vast numbers of systematic errors. I have seen studies um, with 40% of sites doing rounding of blood pressure. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is definitely a systematic issue. Uh, then you have seen studies which are near perfect. Uh, if mm -hmm. you demonstrate that you are not interested in a parameter and that you don't follow it in depth or record it in detail, then sites will sense this. Or if you ask a respiratory physician to measure blood pressure, don't expect them to do it accurately. They're not interested mm -hmm. in blood pressure. They're interested in respiratory. That's that's very important. Yes, um, you also said that the the predefined quality we should predefine quality before uh, we start a study. And what to do if a company doesn't have ex enough experience with that? Um, what would you advise? Um, well, there's clinicaltrials.gov. There's the data transparency websites. Uh, there's a vast amount of publications. Um, I would use all the information that's out there to try and make estimates. In the end, if you're in the very early stages, a phase one or early phase two studies, because your sample sizes are so small, you're e even with something like informed consent, uh, one percent of 20 patients is effectively zero so it, mm -hmm. when you're just starting out with small-scale studies uh, you, you're going to have very t small limits when you're getting to bigger studies uh, late phase two and phase three you, your tolerance limits become more acceptable and probably capture more experience uh, already uh... Yes. So to make to make them tangible, to make them um, understandable, and um, to make them work. And remember, the worst thing that's going to happen is that you'll have to do an analysis to see whether it's systematic or not. And if it is systematic, explain what those what the impact is. So mm. it's not too bad. That's true. So let's continue. Um, um, we, I, I will dive uh, in the more technology considerations about quality tolerance limits because technology is a um, um, is an essential part of uh, implementation. Uh, if you would do uh, uh, implement uh, quality tolerance limits um, um, with uh, with the technology which is not proven or, or which is not um, uh, validated as uh, Andy mentioned also, uh, then it might happen that you will uh, create even more uh, risks um, uh, in a study um, and uh, get a, 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 f a fake understanding of, of the situation, um, uh, so which will guide you even in a, in a worse situation um, as you wouldn't do, for example, this with technology. So it's an it's essential part. And I'm going to discuss uh, the key principles, key challenges uh, on the way, uh, which will definitely uh, be uh, um, uh, relevant to everybody, to every company, actually, which will deal with the technological implementation of uh, quality tolerance limits. So, and I want to start my part of the presentation actually with a very a simple quote. Um, technology is just a tool and a fool with a tool is, is still a fool. And uh, believe me, um, 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 just being uh, as a technology provider on the market, uh, 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 we, uh, we see the proof of this quote actually every day. And, uh, and this is not because that we see a lot of fools, but also we, we see the importance actually, of uh, making sense uh, and understanding um, of what's happening in the trial, uh, it's even more essential than the, um, the, the tool itself. 
uh, or I would say as essential as the tool itself, uh, and the uh, acceptance, uh, the readiness to uh, to uh, accept and to use the tool in the right way uh, is absolutely needed. So um, when you are thinking about um, uh, just um, in the company, okay, we need uh, to go to, to be more compliant with new GCP addendum, we will probably uh, start with the technology. It's actually probably already the first error. So I would start, uh, first of all, with the understanding. I, I would start with the processes. I would start with, uh, with education of people and then continue with the technology. And so only, only that would, this part probably uh, will bring you to the success in the fastest way. So key challenges uh, in considering uh, quality tolerance limits in the, from the technological perspective that we face actually every day are uh, that, um, first of all, that quality and the risks around uh, the quality are not stable. They changed uh, every day, every, every month. Um, so we capture new data, we involve new sites, we get new patients. And uh, uh, there is a certain timeliness that should be uh, in, inside of the quality tolerance limits. So then uh, the quality spread, it, so to say, or uh, is relevant for um, all the data sources that we have, not only DC or not only CTMS, it's actually every data source is relevant. So um, um, in our understanding, um, as much data sources you, you would include, the more holistic uh, control over quality you would get, you, you could get. Of course, uh, remember uh, the cycle plans uh, do study act or plan do study act. So this cycle uh, requires actually the issue management. So uh, study and act parts uh, requires that you you get issues accumulated uh, altogether, pre-arised, assigned to a single point of responsibility, create a mitigation plan or contingency plan, um, a root cause analysis, all these parts. So of course, statistics and mathematics provide you very valuable uh, elements to def to get uh, understanding about your. Uh, data quality uh, from the sense of uh, distributions, from the sense of uh, missing values, from the sense of certain missed um, um, uh, correlations, um, all these uh, elements. So statistics is a powerful tool, again, important to use it correctly in, on that element which, are, which makes sense. And reporting and visualization is also a challenge uh, because it should be uh, visualization, for example, it should be very simple and understandable for everybody, not uh, only to uh, technicians or not only to data managers. Um, it should be um, um, very clear um, uh, presentation of the uh, quality tolerance limits, uh, their thresholds, uh, their escalations, when they get, got escalated, and so on and so forth. So this is, to my mind, is also a very important challenge. Uh, so what are, would be the key principles uh, that uh, I would advise to implement uh, or to see in uh, vendors um, or to, to look for um, by different vendors uh, in regards to quality tolerance limits? Um, the key principles, um, and maybe some of them are connected with the challenges I, I just mentioned, um, I would advise uh, to uh, search for more proactive uh, study quality uh, and risk management. So proactive means uh, to get opportunity to see, to take a look into, into the uh, future and uh, uh, observe the uh, what will happen maybe um, in a month, in a half a year, in a year, uh, and have the opportunity to see that. Involve different recording systems. Again, to my mind, uh, it's not only DC that should be involved, 
Um, um, and you see it's a big um, data source, of course, uh, but don't forget about samples. Don't forget about uh, li li lab data. Um, moreover, when we speak now, for example, about um, personalized medicine and more uh, complicated uh, uh, um, sampling um, patterns, so to say, in the study, uh, um, don't forget about CTMS and uh, it, importance of the documents that are captured there. Um, so uh, uh, even IVRS could be involved, uh, speaking about blinding of a study and such. Uh, so again, uh, these recording systems, uh, they all create part of the ecosystem uh, uh, that can be included into the quality improvements. So um, allow team members also to make more proactive approach. That means uh, involve issue management, uh, uh, involve uh, contingency plans, mitigation plans, uh, and track them so that they they uh, you can you have opportunity to track who has done what at what time point and what effect it had on your study. So. Um, yeah, the, these uh, drive global contingency goals uh, and um, um, nomenclature, nomenclature for tracking issues, of course. Reduce the time and manual effort uh, involving in uh, managing risks and managing uh, QTL. So when uh, let's go through these key, uh, guiding principles step by step and uh, key challenges and see what could be done. Um, so that's what uh, this approach I would suggest. Um, timeliness, and uh, we started with this challenge. Uh, so all the the more you progress through the uh, through the study, um, the more you should correct your assumptions. Um, and the more you should critically review your assumptions, uh, your thresholds, adjust the thresholds if they required, um, if it's required, uh, depending on uh, the uh, your expectations towards quality. Um, be aware about your assumptions. Uh, double check these assumptions on the way. So um, here, the more you progress with, for example, with the acquired uh, subjects, the more this. Um, iterative approach, improvement approach uh, sh uh, should be repeated. And uh, um, be sure that all the results get documented. So when you will finish a trial, you can get a, a, a wonderful uh, picture uh, in your lessons learned uh, discussion where you could go through, for example, your root causes analysis and identify those root causes that uh, um, actually created you the most of the troubles in the study. So, and that's what Andy mentioned with the knowledge management. So, uh, be sure that you accumulate the and systematize the required knowledge for next study or and for your uh, uh, colleagues, uh, for example, from another group who, will, who are dealing uh, with, another, uh, with another study. So, um, this is an example of uh, quality tolerance limits uh, we implemented uh, in uh, our integrity solution. And uh, you recognize that, for example, the, uh, uh, on the background you see the uh, adjustable thresholds. So the thresholds uh, could be more or less fixed uh, or could be adjusted uh, over the uh, over the time and uh, even automatically adjusted based on the performance of other sites. Um, so this is uh, everything what becomes uh, possible actually with the, with the, with the involvement of automat automatic systems because they can uh, literally recheck uh, the assumptions on their own using the statistical mechanisms behind. And you can see that certain escalations happened uh, 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 on this side when the red uh, uh, snippet is on yellow when it was de-escalated and on green when it was already mitigated or uh, so the, pro the issue was solved. So uh, it's absolutely to see uh, to uh, to imp it's imp absolutely important to observe the development of these quality tolerance limits through the time. 
see the uh, the thresholds, be aware about these thresholds, how they get calculated, and understand, okay, what are you really uh, observing here, and how you improving the, them with your uh, with your actions. So uh, and being able to observe the results of your actions uh, in real time or near to real time is, to my mind, absolutely essential. Uh, making proactive approach, and this is wh what uh, where we need to switch uh, to another mindset. To my mind, um, before um, Andy uh, mentioned that we we adapted a zero defects method methodology or philosophy. Um, I think in many studies in many pharma companies, um, uh, what uh, was the biggest problem to my mind till now is that we always reflected on issues. So we always, uh, when something happened, we try to fix that. So uh, now um, it's the time, and there is a possibility involved in technology is where uh, we could be more proactive. That means doing certain actions in order to avoid the even the possibility of certain if, uh, defect happening. So. Um, that's uh, that's certain mindset change that uh, should happen, and uh, this mindset change uh, also already happened in many other industries. Um, for example, um, um, in airways industry, uh, how many thoughts, how uh, how many uh, actions are being taken uh, before, for example, any crash happens and. Uh, simulation of uh, certain risks, simulation of uh, or quality expectations are all get documented and checked and uh, and uh, proved again and again and again um, uh, even uh, before every every plane go, go, uh, come, goes to the, into the air. So this is uh, where pharma industry, to, mo to my mind, can get a lot of uh, valuable um, insights and valuable, um, um, valuable um, actions uh, if we would take a look on those industries which achieved already big results in, the, in, in that. So uh, don't forget about uh, uh, checking the quality uh, on different levels and uh, also associating the the quality also with the diff with the uh, certain with a certain actors so to say so uh, it could be uh, on the patient level on the site level so uh, on the even country level or uh, on the level of the study so um, each of the actor um, has um, influence or can influence the, the quality in different way uh, so patient can for example be sloppy in uh, doing certain uh, or in participating into certain measurements uh, sites could uh, forget entering the data or as Andy mentioned also round the data uh, regional level can in, uh, involve certain uh, cultural differences uh, that uh, influence your qualities, uh, quality tolerance limits, and uh, of course on the study level, uh, that's everything get, uh, needed to be uh, controlled overall, uh, because at the end actually you want to get um, uh, statistically sound, tangible results. Uh, when we speak uh, about predictive models and uh, taking a look into the, into the future, um, still uh, what we see, uh, many companies forget about the uh, importance of the validation. And validation is not uh, um, only uh, making a test, uh, so to say, or a series of tests uh, and make sure that the software works uh, correctly. Validation is, is much deeper than that. Um, validation, uh, particularly involving, uh, for example, prediction, predictive models uh, or uh, risk indicators, quality indicators, it's as absolutely essential to do validation actually also from a scientific point of view. Uh, for example, uh, how, uh, you make to, how you make sure that certain quality tolerance limits, for example, will 
are connected with certain uh, quality expectations that you have or quality goals. Uh, are they enough to, to set up and configure or you need to create a, a series of them, a group of them? Um, the same with the risk indicators. Uh, what is the connection power between the risk and risk indicator? Uh, what, uh, uh, how many risk indicators are reasonable to, to, to include in your trial? Uh, will it be enough to include one to three, uh, or you need uh, maybe 20 or 30? Um, so depending, um, of course, on your risk appetites. Uh, so all these questions are, should be answered and documented uh, during the scientific validation of predictive models, of quality tolerance limits and uh, risk indicators. So uh, involving, um, separating them in a certain validation environment, uh, checking uh, the historical data from different studies or even from different sponsors uh, would allow to document and see okay, what are the predictive power of these or that indicator uh, and what is a reasonable uh, combination of these risk indicators or quality tolerance limits in your study. So, um, uh, again, uh, involving different third-party recording systems uh, will allow you to do a more holistic approach. Of course, it's complicated to do uh, however, um, it's, uh, it's important uh, to head towards this. So starting with this, starting small, maybe starting with EDC first, but then uh, connecting important um, uh, data sources, important processes into your, uh, into your um, quality system. Um, so that you would be um, informed about certain discrepancies and certain uh, data defects uh, from various uh, recording systems. And uh, uh, allowing this uh, will help you to build up, again, holistic um, way of dealing uh, and improvement. Um, so holistic means covering many departments or even uh, making a leapfrog for the whole company uh, in quality. So, um, and uh, this is an example, um, again, from Syntegrity. So we uh, connect to various recording systems uh, and uh, pass the relevant information to a certain business intelligence layer. Uh, not doubling the information, but creating a more um, intellectual network uh, of a trial um, so that a uh, clinical trial manager or um, CRA is able to observe and monitor the whole trial holistically, uh, making a kind of bird eye view or getting the bird eye view or, uh, on, on the trial. So, uh, this is another uh, uh, presentation uh, where uh, the data is captured from various uh, recording systems uh, and passed over internet uh, to a public endpoint that creates actually um, one holistic um, uh, controlling environment uh, where different stakeholders are involved, uh, biostatisticians, CRAs, lead CRAs, even sites uh, could be included as well. So um, uh, the process of the uh, setting up the um, uh, quality tolerance limits is always always straightforward, and it is actually predefined in GCP addendum. Um, it uh, involves actually identification of critical data and processes, uh, where you start thinking, okay, what uh, what are the critical data points we have in a study? Uh, what are the processes are critical for the study and in the whole organization and uh, document this. So this should be a first step uh, how, how you approach this question. 
then you create a certain hierarchy of risks, so to say, uh, and quality expectations, uh, where um, uh, there are certain corporate goals, uh, then you, there are certain uh, goals on the trial level, and then you set up certain goals for sites and even for patients, so and quality expectations as, as well. So, um, um, and this is a, a really sometimes looks like a hierarchy uh, because uh, the uh, uh, overall uh, corporate goals influence uh, the underlying uh, quality expectations. Um, so then you set up certain uh, KRIs, KPIs, KQIs, uh, uh, so performance indicators, risk indicators, and quality indicators. Document them in a report. Uh, get make sure that you get them um, regularly. Uh, make sure that everything gets validated from scientific point of view, from um, uh, integrity point of view. Um, um, associate it with uh, with the data um, in the different recording systems and see that the connection are, is working. So validate the connection separately and uh, start uh, actually um, your data co acquisition, data collection process and uh, um, improvements. So and then you can uh, implement your plan, do, study, act, circle. So uh, I'm moving towards the uh, last uh, slides. Um, I, a couple of words about issue tracking and issue management. Um, so this is absolutely essential part of uh, QTL uh, process because um, without documenting actually what went wrong, without getting a, a automatized um, a notification, without getting a, a single point of responsibility of dealing with these issues, nothing happens actually in the company. And, um, uh, so the documentation, again, what gets uh, uh, documented uh, gets managed, managed, and what gets managed gets improved. So here is absolutely essential uh, to make sure that um, you implement or get uh, from a vendor um, an issue tracking system uh, or use already existing issue tracking system uh, from your company. So again, don't forget that uh, certain issues are uh, escalate on certain levels. Some of them are on country level, some of them are site level or patient level. Uh, don't forget that uh, different uh, uh, QTLs, as a quality tolerance limits, uh, risk indicators or performance indicators could be sources of these um, issues uh, when they breach the thresholds, for example. And make sure that all the issues are get escalated in the right time and in the right to the right person um, or even to the right department because um, it's uh, essential to make it actionable. Otherwise, again, documenting alone is not helping. Making it actionable will allow you real achieve improvements and really improve uh, these systematic errors that Andy was mentioning in the beginning. That's what we're aiming at, at and that's what we, uh, what we uh, want to, to achieve. Document, see what the issues get escalated again and again and again, measure the systematic nature and, and uh, connect them to contingency plans, mitigation plans, uh, see that these, these mitigation plans are really done um, um, and closed um, only when the improvements get documented. So uh, maybe last remarks uh, in regards of uh, statistical monitoring. Uh, it's a very powerful tool and um, it's a kind of tool which goes bottom up, not top down. And these uh, tools is, uh, uh, is also important as or a very important um, element uh, of a quality improvement because, uh, because uh, statistics can check uh, hundreds, thousands of data items uh, simultaneously, compare them among each other. It's impossible to do uh, manually. And uh, the amount of data today is uh, such, so huge that you, we need, all need uh, support um, of automatized uh, uh, statistical monitoring. There are different methods. Uh, many of them uh, are well known. Uh, uh, checking the digit preferences, uh, comparing the uh, uh, means and the uh, 
correlations, variances of, of data, uh, the, all these uh, elements are can help and hint uh, to the areas where the improvements is needed. Of course, again, all the further actions uh, like issue, documenting the issue, connect, connecting with the mitigation plan, uh, doing the uh, actions about it are absolutely essential as um, in any other scenario. So um, I think uh, uh, both approaches, top-down and bottom-up, are very valuable and combining these approaches uh, will help you uh, to improve quality actually from both directions. And I see um, the uh, question from Vladimir uh, uh, Schneidmann. So uh, I think we have now uh, reached more or less the uh, time limits. And uh, uh, if you will have not enough time uh, um, hearing maybe the, uh, the answers to the questions, I would like to say goodbye to everybody. Uh, don't forget that there is a possibility to request a certificate uh, if you require one. And uh, be sure that uh, everybody who participated today will get a, a copy of slides and maybe a couple of additional documents that you could uh, use in your daily life uh, uh, on the way of quality improvements. So now I would like to incentivize everybody who, have, who has a question in mind to use the chat. Uh, we will be available uh, several minutes after the webinar and we will uh, address these questions. And I'm starting with the question with, from Vladimir. How long is uh, transient process, so range? Um, Andy, do you want to address this question? I, I assume that Vladimir means the how wide is the range uh, for the upper and uh, lower uh, confidence intervals or the quality tolerance limits. That depends on the parameter you're measuring. Um, each, each will have its own variation and hence standard deviation uh, which has to be put in there. Uh, typically you would expect to have two or three standard deviations either side of the ex expectation. Um, I agree uh, with you. I have um, usually in our experience we use uh, uh, the ranges uh, that are specific to the therapy and st specific to the uh, certain expectations of a company and goals. Um, and the ranges uh, sometimes get ad uh, adjusted on the way because a company recognizes, for example, that. Uh, uh, the range which they've chosen in the beginning is too wide and they make, want to make it a bit narrow. Uh, we usually utilize a two-step approach. One is a warning signal, so to say, before uh, a big disaster happens and one is a critical limit. Uh, after that, it's, uh, it's already becomes really critical. So it's a two-step approach is, uh, for every uh, quality tolerance limit limit is actually uh, is reasonable uh, however uh, actually there, it could be uh, done in different ways um, uh, depending again on your strategy so it could be several stages and several several limits uh, implemented um, so you will get escalations so to say for different uh, levels and for different departments